What's up, guys? Coming at you from Shenzhen. I'm back from Xinjiang. I flew back yesterday. I'm exhausted. I'm not fully recovered, and I'm just going through some of the bits and pieces of footage I have. It's kind of a mishmash of different things, and um, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to share with you yet. What I'm going to share with you today is a visit to a Kyrgyz village. Um, it was one of the options, one of the, the, the itinerary items that was put forward by the group that I connected with um, halfway through my trip. And it's one of the ones I decided to go to, and I'm glad that I did. Um, it was a really interesting experience. Uh, what it is, is it's a newly constructed village where people who used to live in the mountains in very, very rough, dangerous conditions were given opportunities to come down and uh, kind of rebuild their life in a, in a more stable, safe environment. Uh, they were given tools and infrastructure to also be able to run a business of their own. In this particular village, they were given greenhouses and taught how to grow different things. Some of them some of them grew flowers because that's what they were interested in, and others grew vegetables, tomatoes, and things like that. But what was, what was really interesting for me is that the families who decided not to come down, they still were rewarded with these kinds of things. I would have thought that the government would really want to encourage them to abandon their village and come down and only give these incentives if they agreed to the conditions. But that wasn't the case. Um, despite how expensive it is to maintain the villages up in the up in the mountainside, despite how often the roads were being washed away, how often the power was being cut, how, how often mudslides would disrupt the lives up there um, and people would die from these kinds of events as well, those people up there were still given all of the same incentives down on ground level, um, which they could then rent out to other people if they didn't want to come down and use it themselves. So that was really interesting to me, and it lined up with a lot of other documentaries I saw where, in the past, China was trying to convince um, women in Xinjiang to go into the workforce or to, um, uh, to uh, seek out higher education. And they really spent a lot of time, and sometimes there were emotional encounters where they were trying to convince these women to go into the workforce. And later on, this was kind of misconstrued by Western media, showing that it was this forceful program. But when you actually go around and you see, for example, the, the situation in this mountainside village, they do try really hard to convince people, but it's still done in such a respectful way. Um, it was really interesting. Um, and there's so much more context that's brought into other things that I went to witness and see, which I didn't record. And I didn't really understand the full gravity of it until afterwards. I'll give you an example. I went to go see a factory where they, uh, they were doing embroidering and stuff like that. I bought one of the bags that they made there. And I didn't record because I just thought it wasn't really a big deal. I thought, what's, what's the big deal? Okay, there's a bunch of Uyghur women working in this factory. But afterwards, when we were leaving, Kate, my Uyghur friend, was talking to me about how much that work meant to them, how low their positions were in their family before they were earning a living of their own as well. Um, situations of where they were uh, such a low position in their family, they were experiencing domestic uh, abuse. Uh, but also, if marriages broke down, Uyghur women were in really difficult situations where their prospects of remarriage were extremely low. That's true in any villages around China, but she said it's especially true in Uyghur families. And so these opportunities were so empowering for them. Um, I kind of regret not doing some recording there to tell that story in a little bit more detail, but there's so much more depth to the things that are going on that is just missed and nobody's really covering. Um, so that's what you're going to see in this video. I, I think other than that, the, a really interesting thing for me was to see Kate, uh, a Uyghur, going around in this Kyrgyz village for the first time, experiencing their local culture, trying on their local clothes. When we had lunch together, um, she was comparing her food to their food. Um, I was talking about how similar some Tibetan foods were, or at least the, the butter tea that they were drinking. And it was just a fabulous multicultural experience, a kind of a, a level of multicultural experience that I never expected to have in uh, Xinjiang, in Kashgar. Um, but it was really wonderful. Seeing Kate speak with the locals in the same language was interesting as well because their language overlaps. But in the events when there are some differences in language, they would switch to the common language. They would switch to Mandarin Chinese, which was what it was meant to be uh, all over China, having a common language for people to communicate with each other with. So to see that happen between a Uyghur and a Kyrgyz person... Uh, was especially interesting. I mean, there's a lot of countries in Southeast Asia that did the same thing too. They designated a national language for all the ethnic minority groups to be able to communicate together and participate in the national economy. Um, but it was interesting to see in practice 
uh, the the benefits of that between two um, very different ethnic groups uh, in in the far west of China. Um, other than these videos, I've got some other stuff to share with you later. I've, I visited a school, which was surprisingly um, ordinary. I had quite quite a bit of fun there as well. Um, I've got some interesting stories to tell you about that as well. Um, I walked around the village, the the old uh, ancient city as well, and gave you some context in what rebuilding was done um, and how they handled that as well. And a few other little clips here and there. What I'm most excited to talk to you about is my post-trip summary, which I'll give to you at the end. I'll talk about some of the positives, some of the negatives, and I will also... Um, perhaps in a separate video, talk to you about an interaction I had with a with somebody who graduated from the vocational training center. I didn't record it, um, I but it was a spectacularly interesting, um, enlightening, uncomfortable, uh, thought provoking conversation. Um, one of the reasons I didn't record it was because I got the sense when I was talking to this guy that there's a chance that I could be intruding on a part of his life that he just rather kind of leave behind him Uh, like he just kind of want to move on Uh, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit more detail in those videos coming up but I don't want to take away from the content of this video too much I'm just going to jump into the uh, little bit of vlogging that I did in this Kyrgyz village Um, I'm not I'm not great at these vlogs uh, you know in the field vlogs I don't know how to do fancy editing and stuff like that so I'm just walking around talking and uh, I'm a lot better at this kind of uh Uh, commentary stuff than I am at in the field vlogging but I hope you still enjoy it and I'll see you in the next video I'm excited to share the rest of my trip with you very soon see you soon what's up guys I'm coming at you from just the outskirts of Kashgar it's technically still Kashgar it's one of the village kind of districts and I found something quite interesting here that I want to share with you guys Um, I thought the story was quite interesting Um, first of all let me give you a feel for the surroundings let me flip this around So I don't know if you can see how well you can see in the camera. There's basically snow mountains, really high mountains over there. And it used to have a lot of people, uh, Kurzic people, uh, for uh, living up there. And um, the conditions are very, very harsh up there. Uh, So, uh, you know, every year what was happening, um, let me flip this back around. Every, every year what was happening was there'd be mudslides or when the snow starts to melt, the homes would be washed away, the roads, you know, freshly paved roads would be wiped out again, electricity would be knocked out. And so uh, the government came in and wanted to do something, give them some better options. So what you see around me here are greenhouses. Um, they're quite interesting. I'm gonna take you inside one in a second. These are all greenhouses that they set up um, to allow Uh, the folks from up in the mountain to come down and um, and have an opportunity to build a life down here and it wasn't required in fact there are still 10 families living up there and it's kind of interesting because it created an economy between the two Um, so the folks who decided to come down and lots of them most of them came down I still have some livestock up on the top. So they're paying the 10 other families to take care of their live, livestock up there. But the 10 families who didn't come down, they still got free greenhouses from the uh, government as well. Uh, but they don't want to come down, so they just rented them out to someone else. So they're making some money from this too. Uh, the people who came down... Uh, this truck is going to make a lot of noise behind us. The people who came down um, also got a free apartment. If they had a smaller family, they got a 60 square meter apartment. If they had a bigger family, they got an 80 square meter apartment. Absolutely free, and it's not to use. It's like they literally, they they signed it over into their name. Um, So they really tried to encourage people to come down. Um, And you have a people making a mix of things from um, flowers to uh, to tomatoes, to other uh, vegetables and things like that. So let's take a look inside uh, this one here and I'll show you. So uh, this is the uh, this is a tomato farm. One of my favorite things to eat tomatoes. And um, I met the guy who's uh, responsible for this, who's farming this. <laughs> yeah, there he is. And um, he was uh, there. Is, he's seeing to his uh, stuff here. 
And he, he, when he came down, he was a bit nervous because he says he doesn't know how to grow this stuff. So what the government did was they, um, they sent somebody to train him. They spent a year training him how to control, like to, to, to monitor the humidity, uh, about watering it, how to kind of support the plants, everything, basically everything he needed to know to grow these tomatoes well. Uh, the government came and trained him. And aside from that, he is able to do other work too. Like he also says he uh, helps people renovate homes. Um, so he does some manual labor uh, as well on the side, makes some money. Um, there's more opportunities down here. It's easier for his kids to get to uh, school. Um, and uh, obviously the hospital is easier to get to because a lot of the villages in the mountain, there were no roads up there. And the few that they did build roads to, as I mentioned, they would continually um, fall apart but uh, um, you can imagine how much better life is down here but for 10 people as I said 10 families they decided they didn't want to come down so all the power to them I think this is a pretty good arrangement this is uh, yeah there we go <laughs> really uh really cool i went into another one that had flowers and stuff like that but anyways what i'm going to do from here is i'm going to continue on apparently there's a center that shows what the conditions were before um and uh obviously we can see what they've got here now i didn't get to go see their apartments or anything like that um so i'm not sure what to expect but i'm going to ask to be taken over to that place now and uh, we'll take a look to see what it looks like to see if we can get any sort of a feel for what life was like um, back then I did speak to a couple of people here already who um, grew up as a child on the mountain and really had a uh, oh I almost hit my head there and really has a good perspective to be able to compare what life was like before compared to now and it seems pretty uh, <laughs> a pretty vast the the difference um, anyway so let's go to the next stop and see what we find all right, so I'm here where they actually live. Let's uh, flip the camera around here. So these are the apartment buildings, and it's a whole complex here um, that they've built with, you know, a sports, a playground, school, clinics. Um, they've got a little factory here too. Uh, let me see if I can uh, show you on the board over here. Um, quite, quite an interesting little area. Um, and then on the inside, it's got some pictures of what their old villages looked like. And you can get an understanding for why it was so dangerous. A lot of people lost their lives on the mountain just because of the nature of the condition, the conditions up there. Um, let's see over here. Okay, we got some stuff on the board up here, which will give you a better idea. <clears throat> So, um, yeah, we got uh, some high-tech stuff here that uh, they set up some factories and stuff like that. You know, one thing you've got to keep in mind about these factories is this is the kind of thing, these are the kinds of projects that the U.S. is trying to target by putting sanctions on uh, Xinjiang. It's got nothing to do with human rights or anything like that. It's got to do with the same shit that they pull everywhere else in the world where they design sanctions to make ordinary people suffer, to take their opportunities away, to create unrest and discontent. Uh, because when you look at, and I'll talk about it more, the ridiculousness of some of the claims they made in order to justify those um, sanctions, it's, it's really infuriating when you look at it. But uh, here's the map here of the entire thing. You can see kind of, yeah, football field. Um, little shops and things like that. Well, let's go inside uh, that building there. and We can see what, um, what the old homes look like. They've got some pictures in there of what the mountaintop homes looked like. Some kids playing basketball there. The, um, there's one lady here who's been um, uh, from the same ethnic group who grew up on the mountaintops and when she's talking to me about the difference in her life growing up up there uh, to, compared to down here she gets really emotional 
<laughs> she's really passionate about telling the story because it was um she said it was just outright scary living up there when it rained uh, when it was time to go to school she was like praying it wouldn't rain because um what happens if the, if the road gets washed away again how is she going to get to school and back and then when she was 12 years old she started riding a horse to school sometimes uh, her, her her situation wasn't that bad it was only two kilometers um two kilometers to get to her school but you can imagine without a road over mountainous terrain um, that's still quite a trek every day so let's see here so you can see some of the images here like oh so this is this is one of the images of the what happened to the home after it got damaged by um, kind of waters that were rushing through. There's some even more serious examples here. This is, um, this guy's home is just completely washed away. Look at that. Just one of the walls still standing. When the mudslide or the water came through. Um, that's uh, an example. You, you look at that, the side of the mountain, you imagine some of the rocks. Um, the rocks that were falling down and the mudslides and stuff like that, that was one of the things that was a big hazard. Uh, one of the locals told me as well too, was the, um, the falling rocks. Around the corner here, there's a pretty cool um, model of what a home would look like up there, with the kinds of materials it would be built with, with uh, rocks like this, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't look very sturdy, that's for sure. But yeah, that gives you an idea of what they went, uh, what they came from um, and what they went to here. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a community. Um, it, it's clean, it's nice. I, I could see some people th thinking or saying it lacks, it lacks as much uh, character uh, uh, as perhaps, you know, a village on the mountaintop or something like that. Um, you know, maybe, maybe some people might think it seems kind of sterile in comparison to that. But hearing uh, the stories that I was told about how um, incredibly uh, dangerous it was living up there um, and hearing the emotion when um, the particular lady who was explaining to me um, what it meant to have the opportunities down here I think, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not really fully equipped to uh, appreciate um, how much uh, how much of a change this is, or how much of an issue to make over the fact that it just seems kind of like a regular kind of a compound. Um, it seems like, uh, based on a video I saw in there, they still have their own little cultural shows and stuff like that. Uh, not for tourists or anything like that, for themselves. Uh, they're uh, an ethnic group who enjoys dancing as well, uh, dancing and singing. You see a lot of that in a lot of videos that people uh, put out from Xinjiang. And uh, sometimes it seems like it's overdone, but there really is a lot of singing and dancing. Um, I've avoided uploading any of it. Even the hotel that I'm staying in, there's the cleaning staff. Uh, at least once per day, I've seen them get up on a stage and dance and stuff like that. They're not dancing for anybody. They're just, it's their break or something like that. Um, and they're enjoying themselves. So they do that here within their own community also, um, from what it seems like. Um, and uh, overall, just an increasing, pretty good increase in quality of life. I'm going to go see what the local factory looks like uh, that they've put together here um, for making small products. So let's head over there and take a look. All right, so this is one of the workshops here that they are uh, doing some crafts and stuff. <laughs> Embroidery. <laughs> this is the boss here. Some really nice stuff. Ni <laughs> 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 
Aston Bush Key River. Oh. Ma, oh, 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 is on the head. Oh, wow. This is very beautiful. What do you think, Kate? <laughs> Suits you, looks good. <laughs> very different from your uh very very different from your Uyghur clothes, yeah? Oh it's different from our Uyghur clothes. Yeah. This is Kurdish. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, it's good. Really? Very, uh, uh, very unique. So, so that's interesting seeing Kate. So Kate is uh, uh, Uyghur, and um, she's trying on all the, the their, their their ethnic minority clothes, finding it quite interesting. Um, where where she's from in Kashgar city, you don't get as many um, as much of a mix. It's mostly Uyghur in the in the city area where she's from. But um, yeah, no, this has been really interesting. I think. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up here. I don't know if I see anything else interesting, I'll fire up the camera again, but I might wrap this video up here. Um, and I'll try to, I'm, I'm trying to make some notes as I go along, because there's a lot of stuff I'm experiencing that I thought, oh, this is something really interesting to let you guys know about. Um, and then I forget it. I've got to, I've got to start writing, I've got to start writing stuff down. So many unique experiences, but um, yeah. So Kate, what do, what do you think of this uh, place? I think very good. Yeah. Because uh, at the mountain, I saw this family living style. Yeah. It's uh, actually different. Right. I think now it's better. Yeah. Must they be a very big very, change. I'm really very excited. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I took many, many pictures. Yeah. I want to share my, with my friends. Yeah. Do you mind doing some English translation if we call her to come and just, I want to, her to just explain a little bit how she feels the difference between her childhood on the mountain and life here now. Okay. Maybe, okay, let's go. Okay. So what's interesting too that I want to understand is even though you're Uyghur yeah. and she's, a, how to pronounce it correctly? Kyrgyz. Kyrgyz. Yeah, Kyrgyz. Um, you can understand each other. Uh, yeah, because uh, similar. Yeah, it similar. has some similarities. Uh, but some, some I cannot understand. We can speak Chinese. Right. Oh, and then you speak Chinese to each <laughs> yeah, other. Yeah. The common language. The common to... language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I just wanted to ask her, like, just to explain briefly what it means to her uh, to have this opportunity down here huh. and how, what was it like as a child? Like, was it, you know, she was talking about how scary it was when yeah. it was raining and stuff like that. So the, comparing her life before to now. Uh, Durun <laughs> Tonun cihitlerge çılgalarda yüz şunda cihve. Anakin biz küçük vaktte mektep kebarkan çakta. Asas to bizden tolarda camgar kar köpçeyt. Anan mektep kebaratkan çakta boktağı camgar katto cat. Manday sil kil kalsın korkuyorsa sil kil kalsa yol tayga cevolusa yol dor buzluk gitet. Al gezde manday katnas kolaylı mes asas at minip жол болсо, 
azdır. Biz mayakka köçüp gelgenden kiyen bizden mektep Maşo bizden köçüp gelip ol tıraktaşkan Şaucu'nun işçi de mektep bolğunduk için Azırtı baldar Maşo özünün üyünün altında mektepke çırp kiret Anday manca kilometre yerden mektepke kanday baram degen Cev ol boso maşo tabi apat, sel apat, cebir, uğur, kar apatın təsirine uçuravayt Çünkü macer, tol, pas, maşarın canıga jaylaşkan bolğundan kiyen Tırmış kolaylı, mektep çakın Şuğa azırkı maşar ayıptığız şunday çakşı. Sizin ayıptı. That's a lot to remember. Yeah, yeah, I can. Yeah, it's okay. Whole meaning is, when when she at the childhood, the school is far, far from her home. And if some day it's raining outside, snowing outside, she very afraid. Mm. Uh, because uh, she she going to school riding the horse mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, ride the motorcycle mm. uh, it's very dangerous uh, she very afraid now is he uh, move here the life is changed he uh, she think uh, the all of the childhood very uh, happiness because of uh, school is always there this inside mm -hmm. of the, this uh, uh, this area and uh, all of the things very convenient so she very happy mm, yeah 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 <laughs> okay thank you uh, yeah yeah how to say again yeah uh, yeah Ahmed. yeah, yeah Ahmed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you <It's> just, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay all right <laughs> all right guys so that's probably an even better part to wrap it up then um so i'm glad i caught that last little bit but um as i said before i'll try to keep track of all this stuff and um maybe do a, a, a post-trip summary afterwards with all the little bits and pieces that I, I left out while I was here. Um, but fabulous trip, really interesting so far, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Peace.